of praise to stand upon the mountain and to magnify his name to tell all the people of every nation that he reigns oh zion is calling us to a higher place of praise. Let's sing that again. Sing Zion is calling us to a higher place of praise. To stand upon the mountain and to magnify his name. To tell all the people of every nation that he reigns. Oh, Zion is calling us to a higher place of praise. Oh, how wonderful it is for us to be in the midst of praise and worship to our Father. Wherever we sit, wherever we are, whatever live stream you're on, the Lord is there and we ask him to be in our presence on today so that we could receive his spirit. On this morning, I read to you from Psalm 100. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and we not of ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into the gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Amen. Let's sing this now. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Oh, sing hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. Every praise. Every praise Every is praise to our God. To our God. Oh, sing God, my Savior, God, my healer, God, my deliverer. Yes, He is. Yes, He is. Sing God, my Savior. God, my Savior. God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every word of every worship, word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise, every praise, every praise is to our God. I'll be glad when they say unto us, we can go back to the house of the Lord. Good morning, church by the side of the road. We greet you with a hearty God bless you, a healthy, holy, amen. This is the day the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be therein glad. We welcome all of our members and attendees to our live stream and live feed. Our heart's desire is to be instruments of God leading us in worship. I can't touch you, but we can still touch heaven from where you are. Amen. To all of our newfound cyber fellowship all across the city, the country, and even into the world. To Brazil and Africa, we greet you this morning. Feel free to join in the prayer, join in the song. 
Don't forget to send your prayer requests via www.cbsr.org. You can even mention them in the comments. But talk to us. Let us know that you're out there. Say amen. Hit your emoji. Shout hallelujah. But wherever you are, let us magnify the Lord together. Amen. For this God, he is God. And he shall be our guide even until the end. God bless you. Let's go high in worship. I'll be reading from Ephesians 2, 11 through 15, NIV version. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. Here ends the reading of God's word. Worship is a great place for prayer. 
Wherever you are, call on the name of the Lord. And I want you to know that we have ministers monitoring and following up with your prayer requests. So send them in. Sister Bev's going to lead us in our corporate prayer, but we see the ones that come. We're praying for each and every one of you. We're praying for Sister Stacy Knight. God bless you. We're praying for our seniors who really struggle in, in the normative and in this COVID climate, we lift up Sister McNeely. We lift up Sister, uh, all of our sisters and saints and, and uh, 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 Sister Samuel and so many of you. We're praying with you. Sister Angie, we're praying with you and at the, as your family grieves the loss of your brother, my dear friend, we're standing in the gap. Uh, Sister Margie and uh, Sister uh, uh, Brother Gary and, and that entire family, we're praying with you and for you. Again, send your prayer requests. Call those names before the Lord. Pray for your church. Pray for our continued work in this community. Pray for our work coming forward. Pray for our nation. Pray for those who really are struggling with health and finances in the name of Jesus. This pandemic has impacted all of us in some way, form, or fashion. Pray for our courage and our faith to stand, even as we're forced to face a new norm. Amen? Sister Bev's going to lead us in prayer. Father God, we thank you, God, for the opportunity, God, we have to pray, to come to you, God, humbly and um, recognize you as God of this universe, God of our souls, God that holds everything together. God, we thank you, God, that you invite us to come to you, to cast our cares on you, God, because you care for us, God. We just rec want to recognize you as our Lord, recognize you as the one in charge, recognize you as the one who sits high but looks low, God, the one who knows our hearts better than we know them ourselves, God. And we want to pray, God, for our... Um, <clears throat> Our needs here, God, we pray for Jermaine Hawkins, God, who uh, was in a car crash, God, we pray for him, God, meet every need that he has, God, we pray in the name of Jesus for Tammy Howard, God, we pray for her health issues, God, that you would uh, touch, God, and may your healing virtue go out to her on today. For Daryl Warren as well, God, meet his health needs, God, that he's dealing with. The many people, God, who have been touched and impacted by this COVID virus, God, the ones, God, we pray for... Um, uh, Karen Gross's sister that just has pneumonia, God. We thank you for that, that it is just pneumonia, God, that you have restricted and held back, God, the COVID from her, God. Strengthen, God. Heal her lungs, God, and bring uh, it easier to breathe, God, we pray in the name of Jesus. And Jerry Foster, as well as another God with pneumonia, God, we pray, God, uh, for Cheryl Carlisle, God, who has respiratory illness, God, uh, for Mark Tooley, God, that's dealing with a brain tumor and he's healing from that God so we thank you God for the many answers to prayer God that we've yet seen we thank you God for this time this season God we thank you for your word God that says uh, do not become weary and well doing for in due season we will reap a harvest God so for us God that are short up at home God it's for our good and we thank you, God, that the many trials, God, it says, consider it pure joy for the trials that we're going through because it's perfecting our spiritual right. character, God. And our spiritual character needs perfecting, God. We just pray, God, that you would help us, God, to look inside why we're yet isolated and home, that we would look and hold ourselves up to your word, the perfect word of God that leads and guides us into all truth. God, we can't lie to you. We know if there's inside of us things that are not right, God. If we need to forgive better, if we need to love more, God, help us, God. We pray, God, that you would just give us, God, a, an ability, God, to put others before ourselves, God. Take out in us, God, what is not like you, God. And we thank you, God. We thank you, God, for those that are yet on the front lines, God, helping those that are sick, God, putting their very lives in risk, God. And we pray, God, that you would continue your hedge of protection around them, God. Visit, God, those that are home, sick, God. Even on yesterday, I visited a, a 
lifetime friend of mine, God, that is in her last stages. She's transitioning to go see you in glory, God. And I pray for those that are yet dealing with these things at home, God, that you would strengthen families that are saying goodbye to their loved ones, God. We pray, God, that we would live in short accounts, God, that we would reach out to those, God, that we need to make right in our relationships. We pray for those that are struggling in relationships, God, that you would humble our hearts, God, that we would get right with you so we can get right with people. And if we're struggling, God, with people, it's because we're not right with you. So help us, God, to get right with you, God. And we pray, God, that we would be anxious for nothing, God, but in all things, prayer. In all things, prayer, God. Call us to our knees, God. Call us to our knees, God. We pray, God, for our missionaries, God. Not only ours, but the many, God, who are out there, God. For those in India, God, there's missionaries struggling, God, to uh, not... Uh, panic, to have food, to meet every need, God. And I know of a missionary in India, God, that is just diagnosed, God, and is trying to get home to the United States to get, to get health care. We pray, God, you'd make a way for these missionaries, those that are serving you in other countries, God. Provide, God, provide. You have everything, God. You own it all, God. We pray, God, you just meet every need, God. And the need is great, but you're a bigger God than any need that we have, God, and we worship, we praise you, we honor you, God, we lift you up, God, we extol you, God, because you are worthy, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name. And just before, amen, Miss Beverly, amen. Before we transition into um, our online giving, we've seen quite a few prayer requests come in, so we just want to make mention of that. Um, we lift up Gerald Mitchell, who has petitioned a prayer request, as well as Barbara Warfield, Tammy and her family, Pella McDaniels, Alicia Green, and Mary Hopper. God, we just thank you that you know the needs that they are presenting, God. You know the petitions that they are making, and we come in agreement with them, God, to petition your word as an active source and change agent in their lives, God. We speak to their families and to their situations, God, and we say thank you for the opportunity to agree with their petitions and to put your word upon it, God, and declare that your word is truth, so long as your word is applied, that it will not return void. In Jesus' name, amen. It is now to, time to continue um, our act of worship through giving. Amen. Um, we want to first say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness and giving, for continuing to give your tithe and your offering. We understand that this is a time that is trying for all of us, um, but we see the faithfulness of tithers still coming in and of offerings still coming in, so we just want to say thank you first and foremost. Um, you can continue to give and join with me in this moment through online giving um, from our website at www.cbsr.org. You can also give through Cash App. Through um, Our cash name is CBSR2. Or you can mail in. If you're old-fashioned and you like to send your mail still, you can mail them into the P.O. Box at 68545 Tukwila, Washington, 98168. If you can in this moment, also, thank you for continuing to pour into the capital campaign. Amen? We want to say thank you for that. This is our, for those of you who are unfamiliar with our capital campaign, this is our funds towards remodeling the house of God. Amen. We're agreeing and partnering with God's mission for church by the side of the road. And this is a mandate of our house. So if you have been giving, we say thank you. If you're thinking about giving, we say thank you. It is for the purpose of remodeling here at church by the side of the road and continuing the work and the ministry that God has placed in this house. Amen. God, we just thank you for this opportunity to give. We thank you that we can partner with heaven in this capacity. We can partner with your word through our finances, God. Though we are experiencing hardships, some of us, and though we are learning to trust you more financially in this season, God, we trust and we give, God. We give in hopes, God, that you will continue to pour into us more than finances could bless us with, God. But you continue to pour into us your word and your wisdom, God. We continue to lean and trust in you, God. This is 
a matter of just saying that we still trust you even in this, God. Even in our finances, we continue to trust you. So, God, as we've consecrated our offering and our tithe and our capital campaign, God, as we've set it apart and consecrated it for this reason, we pray, pray blessings over the hands that, uh, that it is leaving, over the wallets that it's coming out of, God. We pray increase in their souls, God, not just in their finances, God, but in their souls. God, and we just say thank you. We say thank you for the faithful givers. Thank you for the tithers. Thank you for those who are giving their offering, God. And we say that it, that it is not in vain, God, but that we are grateful and appreciative for this opportunity to continue to partner with your kingdom in this way. In Jesus' name, amen. You thought, you thought I was worth saving. So you came and changed my life. You thought I was worth keeping. So you cleaned me up inside. You thought I was to die for. Oh, so you sacrificed your life so I could be free. So I could be old and I could tell everything. I'll give you glory Forever. because I am because I am free because I am whole and I can tell everyone I know sing high worship you forever. I will give you glory forever. I'll give you glory forever. God you deserve the honor forever. you deserve the praise forever. I'll praise you forever. forever I love you Lord forever. I love you Lord forever. I love you Lord forever. because I am because I am free because I It's preaching time, and I thank God that there is a word from the Lord. I pray that he gives us preaching power and receptive ears, that we rightly handle and divide the word of Scripture, but information without inspiration leads to just mere perspiration. I pray that he anoint every word that is written, every move of the Spirit that, that rides on the wings of the faith of his people. Amen. Good morning to our entire church family, wherever you are. I pray that you're well, that you're safe. I pray that if you've been ill, that you are recovering. I pray that you are taking practical and yet faithful precautions that you might be a good steward over your health, over your family, and over our community. And again, there is a word from the Lord. Say amen where you are. Amen. The word of the Lord, as found in the Old Testament, the book of Numbers, chapter 6. You, 
Verse 23, 22 through 26, dare I say 27, reads like this. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his sons, saying this, On this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. And make his face to shine upon thee, and be gracious unto thee, and lift up his countenance unto thee, and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. The word today is the blessed fellowship. Amen. Father God, in the name of Jesus, even in this social distance celebration of who you are, Lord, we ask that you consecrate, dedicate, and bless every heart that is prostrate right now to hear a word from you. Make our hearts fertile, make our ears receptive, make our souls responsive to every move of God. Consecrate this hour, bless your word, have your way, and as you move, Lord, we'll declare the Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes, and all the people, wherever you are, said amen. The blessed fellowship. A couple of weeks ago, we said it, it kind of hit different when you used to wake up and wonder or decide whether or not you're going to church. It sure does hit different when they say you can't go to church. Come on, somebody. In the midst of that, I realize in the midst of this COVID pandemic and that has forced us to this new norm, I, I realize, Deacon Brother Ralph, what I miss most about not being in fellowship and being in church or being at my house of worship. I sure enough miss the fellowship in itself. Amen. One toward another. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting law. I know God saves us one at a time, but I know he grows us in the cluster of fellowship. Somebody say amen. If you're on the internet, I know you miss the fellowship. Amen. Not only do I miss the fellowship, I miss the fire. You know, we're just sticks in God's bundle, but when you rub one stick up against another stick, fire starts to happen. And that's what happens in the fellowship. I know I can worship at home. I worship in the car. I worship in the backyard. I worship in the shower, the garage, wheresoever I am, I worship. But something happens when God's people standing on his word, calling on his name when my praise and your worship rub up against each other in an upper room experience there's a tendency, a propensity, a promise from the providence of God that fire falls I swear I missed the fire come on somebody and brother Chuck, elder Chuck, big Chuck I miss the final blessing you know they used to tell us when we went to church, Alondra don't leave without the blessing. And I've been so blessed in church now, I'm preaching now, so I don't have the opportunity to leave without the blessing. But you know, we trying to make our way to the car so we can get to Sizzler first, you know. And, and we try to get to the car so we can uh, uh, miss the uh, pile up out of the parking lot. But I tell you, don't miss the final blessing. I tell you, the body of Christ is the blessed fellowship. I said it's a blessed fellowship. I mean, I, being saved is not about religion. It's, it's relationship with God through Christ Jesus. Come on, somebody. But when he saves us, he saves us into the fellowship. I mean, that's why the Hebrew writer said, forsake not to assemble yourselves, such as the custom of some. I know we live in a contemporary, sophisticated society that thinks we don't need each other. But though he grows us one at a time, cut flowers don't last long. We need the fellowship. Now, now I know uh, so many of us are saying it. They done text me and seen me and said, oh, when they lift this COVID, I'm going to join your church. Listen, you can't join the fellowship. You can join church, but you got to be born into the fellowship. Marvel ye not that I say unto you, you must be born again. I tell you, it's a blessed fellowship, but it's a spiritual fellowship. And I'm not just talking about CBSR. In the midst of this pandemic crisis that got everybody on edge, listen, we are blessed already, and we are born into a blessed fellowship. Amen. Amen. 
Now watch this. This is deeper than on the surface level elementary understanding that I'm born again. Ephesians 5, 11 through 16, Paul is teaching that when we're born into Christ, we're not only born into the fellowship, but God through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ has created a new humanity. My grandmother used to say, but two kind of people, saved and unsaved. I know we live in a divided time where people say it's Republican or Democrat or black or white or rich or poor. No, mama said, they're saved and unsaved. Here in Ephesians, Paul deals with that dividing petition of people, the Jews and the Gentiles. But what he says is, don't forget that you were born into a fellowship, and when you were born into the fellowship, God removed every dividing petition, and he created for himself a new, the Bible says a new man, but he's not talking gender, he's talking humanity, which is the spiritual man. Come on, somebody. So when you're born again, you're born into a different humanity, and the world thinks we're crazy. But that ain't the first time folks thought I was crazy. Not just here at CBSR Fellowship, but the fellowship of believers everywhere. The universal body of Christ represents the new humanity that is birthed into the universe, not just the world, because, see, we're going to be the body of Christ when this world passes away. Come on, talk to me. The death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, the belief, the acceptance, and, and the invitation of Christ into your heart. We're born. Look at verse 15. Uh, by abolishing the law of the commandments expressed in the ordinances that he might, watch this, create in himself one new man man in the place of the two. What two? Jew, Gentile, what two? Saints and sinners, what two? B religious, non-religious, what two? Anything that divides us, Christ created a unified, uni a new humanity. Because that which is flesh is born of the flesh, but that which is spirit is born of the spirit. And he speaks to this new spiritual man. Making peace. Peace with what? Peace with God. We were once divided because of sin, but we're now at peace with God. Come on, talk to me. And thereby reconciling both to God in one body. Watch this. Through the cross, killing the hostility, ESV says, animosity. But our sin divides us. Christ's death, burial, and resurrection unites us, justifies us is the spiritual word, makes us one with God and one with each other. That ain't even my point, but I just need you to know that. In all of this, we talk about blessing, but the blessing of God is for the people of God. And I got to remind you and encourage you, this sermon today is just a, a word of encouragement to the people of faith. And if you're not the people of faith and somebody has invited you to the watch party, I stop by to tell you, you must be born again. But just because you must be born again, don't mean you can't be born again. He said, I stand at the door and knock that you might be invited in. He, if you invite him into your heart, He'll welcome you into the fellowship. Do I have a witness? Yes. Not only are we the beloved fellowship, we're, we're what Dr. Martin Luther King called the beloved community. The beloved community. And that is to say love is the modus operandi of this new fellowship. I tell you, it's a blessed fellowship. But since we're new creatures, new creations in Christ, we don't operate on the old standard. He said, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. Now, if we struggle in the newness of Christ, loving each other, Jesus already put in the canonized measuring stick, love as I have loved you. So if you struggle loving each other, it's because you may not have experienced the love of God. See, once I've experienced the love of God, all excuses are gone. He didn't say love her like she loves you. She didn't say love him. He didn't say love him as he deserves to be loved. No, we who are loved of Christ are called to operate in Christian love. 
And you don't have to be a biblical scholar. You don't have to be a seminary PhD. You have to be a recipient of God's love. And just play that forward. Come on, talk to me. Love is the modus operandi of this blood love community. He said, you will know, they'll know you are my disciples. John 13, 35, by your love one for another. The agape love of God is a transformative love. We love in Christ because we are changed, but the love of Christ changes things. And when Dr. King talked about uh, 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 um, the beloved community he says not only is it operating in love but it, it operates in what Dr. King called a synthesis of opposites synthesis of opposites what does that mean pastor I'm going to show you I'm going to teach today a little bit Patty it means that there are two opposites operating in us as a new humanity can, can I make it plain? That's what he meant when he says you're in the world, but not of it. That's what he meant when he said to be wise as serpents, but gentle as doves. They're both operating. See, we want to be gentle as doves, but naive and operate in a naivete around the world. No, he says be wise as serpents. Gentle as doves, tough as a snake, but gentle as a dove. A synthesis of opposites. And, and see, this is impossible in the flesh. It has to be done in the spirit. And because of this synthesis of opposites, we're now able to bless those that curse you. Pray for those that despitefully use you. Love your enemies and turn the other cheek and have peace in the midst of the storm. I tell you, there's a synthesis of opposites. No matter how hard I climb, I still feel I'm at the bottom of the totem pole. Come on, talk to me. The synthesis of opposites that operates in the spiritual rewiring allows me to have joy in sorrow, hope in hopelessness, help in helplessness. Let the poor say I'm rich. Let the weak say I'm strong. Not out of a naivete, not out of, of a distorted view of the reality, but it's a synthesis of opposites that changes my disposition no matter what is happening around me. Not only is it a beloved, y'all still with me? The blessed fellowship. We operate in the blessed assurance. Let me say it again. We're operating in the blessed assurance. Are you hearing me? This blessed fellowship, this beloved community has the blessed assurance First John 5, 11 and 12. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Watch this. And he who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. That's our testimony. I'll stand on it. But here it is. So often as we navigate in the newness of life, the storms of life around us can make us doubt the assurance that Christ gives us. Come on, somebody. In a COVID-19 culture, I'm taking practical steps to stay healthy, to stay whole, to stay well, washing my hands. Each Sunday, I, I touch my face less. I keep my house clean. I keep folk from visiting. But one day, I may get sick. But if I get sick, it won't be the end of me. Even if I die, I'm still alive. <laughs> Now here it is, this blessed fellowship, we operate in the assurance of the eternality of salvation. But here's the, here's the challenge, can I, can I give you some, let's take it off the high lofty levels of theological doctrine, let's get into some practical hindrances to people's faith walk. So often folk come to the blessed fellowship, the congregation or the local body of Christ, the church dare I say, and they expect 
expected to be something that is not called to be. This blessed fellowship standing on the blessed assurance is not a perfect fellowship. It's just a pardon fellowship. You didn't hear me. It ain't perfect. We are not perfect. I'm just forgiven. We are not a perfect fellowship and in your fellowship you keep expecting the church to be perfect and your feelings are hurt. Your, your faith walk is hindered. Listen, if we were perfect you wouldn't be welcome here because you ain't perfect. We're just a, a plethora of pardoned people in pursuit of his perfection. Now there is injury in the fellowship, but most church hurt from my 28 years of experience comes from folk who expected the church, the pastor, the choir, the deacons, the ushers, the members to be one thing. And when what they expected the church to be rubs up against the reality of what the church is, they fall apart. Yeah. The church is just a hospital of sick souls who've been pardoned by Christ and are in pursuit of his purpose for our lives and what we can't do alone, we can do together. Sometimes we gotta limp together. Sometimes we gotta fall together. Sometimes we gotta get up together, but we gonna stick together because we have the blessed assurance is that he that holds us together is stronger than anything that would divide us. I want to free somebody from unhealthy expectations of the fellowship of believers. Right. Amen. Are you getting it? It's a blessed fellowship. It ain't perfect. It's just pardoned. And you get a bunch of pardoned people in one place, eventually somebody going to have to say, pardon me. <laughs> Pardon me. I didn't mean to step on your toes. Pardon me. Actually, I meant to step on your toes, but I kind of relapsed into the old me because I'm still struggling walking in the new me. Because sometimes people do mean to hurt you. But it ain't my intent to walk in who I used to be. I'm still wrapping my mind, my heart, my soul in how to walk out whom he's called me to be. Somebody say we're not perfect. We are pardoned. And I'm assured of that. Because the pardon of Christ in my life, King Brother Greg, is not contingent on me. Oh, you didn't hear me. It's contingent on the faithful, wonder-working power of the blood that was shed to me. He has forgiven me. Come on, somebody. At best, I'm learning how to walk in this newfound pardon. Can I get a witness? I ain't even got to the good part of the sermon. It's a blessed assurance that we stand on. And this blessed fellowship is assured of the pardoning grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. But we're also blessed, Sister Patty, for faithfulness. Now, I know part of my calling, Elder Chuck, is to be a preacher's preachers. So I, I, I believe God has burdened me with a call not only to shepherd the flock, but to be a, I don't know, a mentor or a teacher or a shaper of other preachers, young and old, male and female, because I don't get to pick who God calls. Amen? God just put it on my heart to equip them. Come on, somebody. What the body of Christ can't afford is another generation of weak preachers. And we got pulpit, penny hustling pimps preaching prosperity from God's pulpit when in fact I still believe that people are hungry and thirsty for the word of God. Can I get a witness? Now, having said that, when I have these workshops and symposiums or just in relation, uh, you know, I got brothers and sisters that don't even go to this church and, and I try to work with them and walk with them and they say, but pastor, uh, uh, how do I shape my ministry? How do I do this? Get like this? Get here? They got visions of where they want to be. Where we got to, and, and 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 they often look at me. Uh, I don't want to say with disdain, but underwhelmed when when they hear my response. And all our understanding and getting, they they expect some profound, prolific uh, bounty of words. But I tell them. 
if God has called you, he's going to call you to his work. The, and I'm talking to my millennials who play the video games, the cheat code of powerful ministry. Let me come back to my boomers. The power behind the efficacy of your ministry won't be in no gimmick, won't be in no app, won't be in no newfound, no. It is required of a steward to be found faithful. Yeah. You, 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 God called you to cast your net on the other side and launch out to the deep water. Just be faithful. You don't need the, the newest Bible app. You don't need the newest rigmarole. You don't need the newest gimmick. You don't need to put a barista in the middle of your sanctuary. Just be faithful. Now, I know that's an underwhelming answer, but you'll be surprised how powerful faithfulness is. Can God count on you? He who has called you wants to be able to count on you. Let me say it like this. God is calling us to be faithful. First Corinthians 4, 2 is required of a steward to be found faithful. Now, if you're called in ministry, if you're called in the witness, if you're called as a believer, we're called to carry his witness as a steward. It, it ain't your witness, it's his witness. Now he's called to be, we're called to be faithful with the witness. Come on, talk to me. If you got a calling on your life, it ain't your calling, it's his calling. And you're a steward of his calling and you're called to be what? Faithful. He didn't call you to be successful. He called you to be? He didn't call you to get rich. He called you to be? He didn't call you to be a mega church. He called you to be? He didn't call you to be dynamic, breath blowing, healing, prophesying, soothsayer. He called you to be faithful. Now he who calls us to be faithful, faithfulness requires integrity. And God will test our integrity with the little things. Let me say it again. With the little things. God tests our integrity with the little things. Integrity is a scientific term that deals with the, um, the purity of metal. Now metal is made and whether it be gold, steel, the more impurities, the less strong the metal is. Hey, come on somebody. Now how do you make it stronger? You got to heat it up. When you heat it up, whether it's gold, steel, iron, or all of that stuff, the heat brings the impurities to the top. It's called dross, and they scrape it off. Now, some of the metal of your calling, of your faith walk, of your faithfulness, of your church, is whether or not this pandemic has turned the heat up and exposed some things, little things. Come on, that are causing cracks in your integrity. God, test that, not so that you can flunk, but that we might be refined. My wife and I, we were, we were, uh, we were a pandemic -y fellowship. It was just us. We hid from our kids and, and hung out uh, the other morning. Amen. And she has this book called 300 Some Odd Questions. She's listening. She's watching. She's nervous. She's wondering what I'm going to say. And she asked one of the questions, a book of questions. We're going back and forth. She said, would you steal to feed a starving child? She was so surprised at my answer. Not at my answer, but how fast my answer was. Nope. Now she knows, she knows my integrity. She knows my integrity is intact. But my no was too quick. I could see it on her face. Why? Because I don't steal. Now, the question asked, would I steal to feed a starving child? There were no, um, what's it called? No disclaimers, no qualifiers and parenthetical, uh, 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 yeah, 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 none of that. I'm not stealing. Now, would I feed a starving child? Sure enough. But I ain't going to steal. You understand? Why? Because stealing makes me a thief. Guess what? I'm not. A thief. I'm okay with being without before I compromise who I am. And, and I don't know about you, but I've been without before. So, you know, the Lord has blessed me with a couple of things, but, but I'm not going to sell out who he made me now. Yeah. Because that's the integrity of who I am. But because I don't steal little things, God is able to trust me with bigger things. 
So if you steal a quarter, you're still a dollar. You steal a dollar, you're still a hundred. You, you ain't hearing me. I used to tell this story. I can't take credit for it, but I, I don't know where I got it from, so it ain't mine. Consider that the disclaimer. Uh, that movie, Indecent Proposal, with Woody Harrelson, I forget who his girlfriend was, Demi Moore, somebody, and they struggling, and money is funny, and change is strange, and some dude at a job, wealthy dude from, from upstairs in the penthouse, offers a million dollars for one night. Come on, somebody. Now, the story is, <laughs> hypothetically, uh, a $10 million offer for a, a night, you know, of intimacy, posh hotel, whatever, top floor somewhere, $10 million. Said, I don't mean no harm, I'm not no pervert, whatever. $10 million cash for a night of intimacy. She said, well, can I think about it? Sure enough, I, you don't need my number, I don't need your number. We'll meet again, and we'll discuss it. <laughs> So they rendezvous up, he has his duffel bag, 10 million cash, opens it, considered the proposal. She said, yeah. He closes the briefcase of 10 million, puts it aside, puts up a $100 bill. He offers her the same proposal. She slaps him in the face, says, what kind of woman do you think I am? He says, we already established that, now we're negotiating the price. She mad because he's treating her like a prostitute, but when you said yes to 10 million, you're a prostitute, whether it's a dollar, ten dollars, a hundred dollars, or ten million dollars. Your integrity will be challenged. Is your integrity at a price? I learned in business school that everybody has a but the difference between me is my price has already been paid on a hill far away on an old rugged cross. Jesus paid it all and all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain and he washed me. And now I'm walking in that integrity. Oh, come on, talk to me, children. Can we be faithful when the price for compromise is high? Revelation 2.10 says, be faithful unto death. Watch this. And I will give you a crown of life. We're blessed as a, for fruitfulness. Can you say fruitful? In short, we're called to bear fruit and be fruitful. And sometimes we get it twisted by, by, by bearing fruit. It's Galatians 5, 20, 22. He said, the fruit of the spirit, notice there's no S. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, God, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and against such there is no law. Meaning you can't religiosity the expectation of fruit from your walk with Christ. You can't say this ain't, our, we ain't that kind of church. We, that's not how our bishop does it. No, Jesus said the gift of the spirit in you will bring forth fruit from the spirit out of you. Yeah. And that's required that all of us bear fruit. Now we all want to jump to John 15, 8, where he tells us to be fruitful. And we think fruitful means having a successful, productive ministry. But I stopped by to tell you that we are blessed for fruitfulness, but God is more concerned about who you are than what you can accomplish. That is to say the fruit of the spirit as a direct derivative from the spirit being alive in you. In the law, in the court of law, they said the tainted fruit from a tainted tree is inadmissible in court, meaning it doesn't matter what it looks like or how powerful it is. If the tree is toxic, so is the fruit. I stop by to tell you, doesn't matter how successful your ministry, how powerful your prayer group, how much money your bank account is. If God has changed you and he comes to the tree of your life and doesn't see the fruit, and I don't care if you a banana tree, an apple tree, a grapevine, Listen, he tells you what fruit he expects from us. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, temperance. He tells you what fruit he planted in you. That is to say, he's trying to cultivate his character in you. And we are called to bear fruit. Now be careful when you become judgmental and you're trying to look at the tree of other people's life. You don't know what season they're in. 
Amen. Jesus cursed the fig tree because when he got there, it was fruit season. And it looked like it had fruit, but it wasn't no fruit. I stopped by to tell you, don't be fooled in the fellowship. Folk that look like they got fruit. Oh, good God from Zion. Folk claim to be faithful, but then they argue about tithing. <laughs> you ain't got no fruit. Folk claim to walk with God. And every time God's word is preached, they got some antithesis on why it don't take all that. It don't mean that. Listen, you just got a rebellious disposition. And I'm not here to fight that. I'm going to keep preaching. But I'm going to pray that his spirit bring forth fruit in your season. Come on, somebody. Let me move on. Are y'all with me still? Am I helping anybody? He calls us and has blessed us to be faithful and fruitful. And by fruitful, he doesn't just mean success in ministry. Ministry. He's talking about the transformative nature of the character of every believer. This Galatians 5, Sister Bev, ain't just for the pastor, the bishop, or the missionary, or the evangelist. It's for every born-again believer. And I stop by to tell you, we're so preoccupied with trying to operate in the gifts of the Spirit, when in fact, we should make first and foremost our priority to cultivate the fruit of the Spirit. And that is in the character of Christ in us. Because the baptismal ministry of the Holy Ghost is to make us into the image of the Son of God. Are you hearing me? We're blessed to be a blessing. I said we're blessed in the fellowship to be a blessing. Now I know, it's particularly in America, we get so caught up in our own personal soteriology, our own soul salvation. I'm going to heaven. I'm delivered. Bless me. Enlarge my territory. Listen to our worship song. So, so often our worship song, if you're not careful, is about us. I mean, we're singing to God about us. Bless me. Deliver me. It looked like the M-E is bigger than the G-O-D. When in fact, he who blessed us has blessed us, not for us, but so that he can use us to bless others. I said it's a blessed fellowship, but we're not called to be reservoirs of blessings but rather conduits of blessings. What's the difference between the reservoir and the conduit? You ever drive by a reservoir, it's this big old thing full of water. Yeah. Amen? The conduit ain't that big. Yeah. It could be a pipe, it could be a hose. I ain't no contractor, but I watched the DIY channel, DIY. Bro, Gray's a contract. The, con the conduit, be it... In, in irrigation or electricity or whatever, or when it is designed so that the resource can flow through it, not be stored in it. And so often, the blessing of God in our own climate of personal soteriology, we want to store up blessings when in fact we're missing the mark that we're just mere conduits that God has blessed me so he can bless others through me. It's tight, but it's right. Provocative question is, how can God use me? Isaiah said, I was in the Lord's presence on the Lord's day. The Lord said, who will believe our report? Who shall I send? Isaiah said, here am I. Send me. He said, I'm in a room I ain't got no business in, and I'm witnessing some stuff that's well above my pay grade. But since I'm here... Yeah. Use me. And then God said, okay. And then Isaiah started making excuses just like you and I. Oh, but I'm unclean. I can't. I ain't. Ugh. Wait, you just opened your mouth. If you avail yourself, God will use you. It, it, listen, listen, listen. If you, we said it last week, and there's still meat on that bone from last sermon. If you open up, he will light you up. Come on, somebody. And use you as a torch for his light. Are y'all still with me? We're blessed to be a blessing. Which takes me to this salutation in numbers, this 
blessed benediction, this Aaronic blessing, the liturgical, Levitical blessing from the priestly call on Aaron's life and Aaron's sons. A lot is said about blessings. Are y'all still with me? Blessing in the Hebrew native tongue is Barak. And one commentator describes it as a world or life transforming word spoken over an assembled people of faith. Somebody say Barak. Number 622 to 27 is known as the Aaronic blessing. That is the priestly blessing, also known in rabbinical literature as the raising of hands. So all intents and purposes, when the priest would stand up and offer this blessing, the people of God would raise their hands, amen, out of surrender and receptivity. You know, the emoji for prayer is here when it should be here. I mean, this is supposed to mean humble submission, but look, when God begins to bless, you better lift your hand so you can catch it. <laughs> can I get a witness? If you're on the, on the line, put that, put that, this here emoji, I don't know how to call it. It's what he said, praise hands. So here it is. Let's look again at the ironic, I say ironic, not ironic, ironic blessing found in number six. 22 all the way to 27 if you will an elementary examination of the blessing we see what one commentator calls it the formula for blessing because we all want to be blessed come on somebody and we just discovered that the fellowship is blessed and we're blessed to be a blessing can I get a witness but here is the formula for blessing y'all all right open your Bibles to number six Blessing is defined as a transformative, life transforming, world transforming word spoken over the people. A word of God's favor spoken on an assembled congregation. Now this is where we struggle in modern American Christianity. Our Christianity is so personal that we miss the importance of congregational blessing. I know as Pentecostals, we, 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 we're charismatic and we shout over the Holy Ghost. But you do know that the baptismal ministry of the Holy Ghost was born congregationally. They, they, everybody say they, they were in one place. They were in an upper room. And suddenly, like a mighty rushing wind, spirit fell on them. You don't hear me. When Moses went up and got the law, he brought it back to them. Amen. There is a them blessing. Can I get a witness? Now, as my grandmother used to say, don't leave without the blessing. A lot of times we stand to give the benediction and folks start making their way out the back door. In the old days, the ushers would, usher board number one, would, that was the mean ladies who had bad feet and had, by the end of service, they was already in the attitude in those places. You wasn't walking in prayer, you wasn't walking in scripture, and you wasn't walking out without the final blessing. Somebody know what I'm talking about? Yes, all, this, all this new church, you know, they, they used to have, whoa, they used to have pit bulls on the door. Yes. They'll come to you, with, and spit that gum out. They didn't care if you was in the choir or the pulpit. Come on, somebody. They wouldn't let you walk out without the blessing. Let me just cut to the chase. And don't you leave this planet without the blessing of God on your life. Can I get a witness? Now let's look at it. First we see a reorientation through the revelation. Look at verse 22 to 23. Now this is Moses gets a word from God in verse 22. The Lord spoke to who? Moses. Somebody ought to just shout because God's still speaking. Now the word God spoke to Moses. Verse 23 God told Moses to tell Aaron and told Aaron to tell his sons. And look, look, look. And he's, look at the word. Great. It says, tell them this is how they should bless the children. You don't hear me. Listen, by reorientation, so often we think our blessings come from other places. But all the blessings of God come from God. And scripture said, and the Lord spoke. I mean, we could just, we could speak, we could preach a six week series on just that part. The Lord gave a word to Moses. Moses gave instruction word to Aaron and he deputized them for the priesthood of God. 
What that means is God calls who he wants to use. Be careful who you let bless you. Mm, I said it. Everybody want to be these <laughs> these downloaded internet self-ordained prophets and apostles. If God ain't call you, please get somewhere. There's several vacant seats in here. And sit down. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> Old Testament, New Testament, we're deputized by him. And if God don't call you, I'm not gifted in how, I'm not interested in how talented you are. Come on, somebody. Are you called? And look at, in that, God says it three times. I'll bless you. I will bless you. I will bless you. The Lord will bless you. Yahweh will bless you. Yahweh will bless you. The emphasis is heightened on the revelation of, that the God of Israel is the source of all grace, all blessing, all hope, and all peace. And must reorientate our, our gaze, not inward, but upward. Our blessings come from the Lord. I know you think it comes from your degree. I know you think it comes from your business license. I know you think it comes from your bank account. I know you think it comes from your stock portfolio. I know you think it comes from your lovely wife. I know you think it comes from your providing husband. But your blessing things come from the Lord and it forces us to reorientate our gaze based on this revelation from self to up and sometimes we can become so sophisticated and misguided in the misunderstanding of the source of our blessing your stimulus check ain't your blessing your stock portfolio is not your blood. Your net worth doesn't find you. You define you. Your education doesn't find you. All blessings come from God. So in the midst of this tumultual time, look up and be blessed. I don't know what's going to be next. But when I look up, I know he holds the future. When I look up, I lift my eyes unto the hills. Because I know my, I said the hill, not Capitol Hill. Not Olympia, not the county seat. Yeah. Higher. My God is higher than 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. My God is higher. And my blessings come from him. Yeah. And I know this is a troubling time, a cause for anxiety, concern, but look up and be blessed. Look at what he said. The Lord blesses thee. Yeah. Yeah. The Lord, not the pastor. Not the mayor, not the governor, not the president, not the congress, not the, the Lord blesses thee. And I know this is an awkward time, but hey, listen, listen, listen. Sometimes God got to shut you down to open you up. So many churches are streaming online and they're reaching more people than they could reach on a Sunday morning regularly. Heard Dr. Braxton preach this morning talking about when God told Peter and them that after the resurrection, they went back to fishing and they couldn't find no fish. He told them to cast their net on the other side. The premise is maybe the church has been doing things the same way so long and that's why you can't gather nothing and you need to try. Other side is relative, you know, other than what you've been doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden you got 900 views. You didn't have 900 people. Are you hearing me? In this, I'm not saying God uh, blesses this pandemic. I'm just saying in the midst of the pandemic, the God who blesses still blesses. Do I have a witness? Not only through revelation we get a recalibration, but there's a blessed preservation. Can you say preservation? God, in verse 24, says, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. How many of you know God is a keeping God? Yes. Scripture says the Lord bless you and keep you. Blessing in the book of Numbers includes numerous descendants, fruitful land, good health, long life. But watch this, protection from your enemies and, and God's abiding presence. That's why your grandmother said he's a rock in a weary land. He's a, he's a leaning post that won't give away. Watch this. It, it, Moses wrote this, so Moses is speaking experientially. 
Come on, somebody. The people who lived under the protective umbrella of God's mighty hand, they had experienced his deliverance from the terrible bondage in Egypt, as well as provision and protection in the far throughout wilderness as an aspect of his blessing. His presence would guard them throughout their lives, not only now, but for generations to come. What about us? Moses is giving this word, and it's not just a blanket salutation at the end of service. Moses is speaking from a experience can you can so don't lose the authorial intent of what of who wrote it watch this Moses knew God was a keeping God why because when Pharaoh was killing all the babies God kept him in a basket when the basket could have sank and been eaten by crocodiles God kept him in the Nile when God when the, when Pharaoh's daughter pulled him out of the Nile raised him as her own son God kept him in the palace when he found out who he was and what he was called to God kept him in the desert place and when he led God's people between a rock and a hard place God kept him at the Red Sea when God when he, when he called him up to the Mount of Sinai God kept him in the mountain I tell you he's a keeping God and I know that we're in the midst of some perilous times but has God already shown you that he'll keep you well you ought to say amen He's a keeping God. All to be kept by Jesus. He'll keep you when your money is funny and your change is strange. He'll keep you when those used to say hallelujah, roll their eyes at you. He'll keep you when they put knives in your back and pull the rug off under your feet. He'll keep you when you walk in the room and all of a sudden it gets quiet. He'll keep you when they put the red foreclosure on your door. He's a keeping God. And you keep wondering how he's going to keep you. Look what he says. My abiding presence will keep you. And this is numbers, but what I love about Jesus is he's the fullness of God. Look what he said. And I promise never to leave you nor forsake you. God may not turn off the furnace, but I read the through and three, and the fourth one was in the midst. Lord, if you don't turn the furnace off, let me know you're in here with me. And if he is with me, he's more than anything against me. He'll keep me in the furnace. He'll keep me in the freeze. He'll keep me in the mountain. He'll keep me in the valley. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God is with me. Let me give you the rest of this. It's recalibration through the revelation. There's preservation through the abiding presence of God. There is illumination. I said last week on the road to Emmaus that if you open up, he'll light you up. They said, did not our hearts burn while he walked with us along the way? But verse 25 says, the Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. Yes, he'll light you up if you open up. You know, illumination is more than your intellectual acumen. I don't know how God did it, but he sure enough did. I've had the opportunity to study in some of the best schools, not only in this country, but in this world. My alma mater, University of Washington, their motto is luck sit. That's Latin for it. That's actually bad Latin. It should be fiat sit. But lux sit is bad Latin for let there be light. The idea is that in the field of academia, there is an enlightenment. I had the opportunity to study in a certificate program at Oxford University in jolly old England. Oxford University was established in 1231. That's how old that is. In, in the 1400, year 1400, they established their motto, Dominina Nuestro Illumine. And that means the Lord is my light, from Psalm 27. 
What are you saying? Even academia knows that there is an illumination that comes from up high. Information still needs inspiration. Can I get a witness? The shining of God's face on God's people by which his good pleasure and his acts would be exerted on behalf of his precious possession is enhanced by the invoking grace of God. I said God's grace illuminates things. Can you hear me? Grace is important even in the Old Testament. I know our New, Pe New Testament uh, charismatic Pentecostals don't think grace shows up until Acts. No, you see it here. His grace shines on thee. Now it's called grace. Why? Because the blessing of God can't be earned by obedience. Otherwise that would be compensation and God will not be indebted to no one. Can I get a witness? Nor can his grace be annulled by our unfaithfulness. God's grace, we didn't earn it and we can't lose it. Come on, talk to me children. God extends his graciousness out of his steadfast covenant love. In the Hebrew, the word is has said. God loves us because he chooses to, not because you and I are worth it. We prove our disworth on a daily basis. It's because he chooses to, and it's according to his self-determined will to bless those whom he desires to bless. Can I get a witness? Now, again, this is experiential. Moses wrote this. Moses knows something about the illumination. Remember when Moses got mad and threw the tablets at the God's people? Amen. When they built the, uh, the golden calf and then Moses went back up to the, uh, 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 to the mountain. Y'all remember that? And God said, this time you write it down. Come on, somebody. God said, I got a word for you, but you're going to have to do the work this time. First time, the Bible says God wrote it with his own finger. Come on, somebody. And sometimes we take the, we so cavalier with the favor of God. Since God did it like that last time, he'll do, no, no, you do it this time. Amen. So Moses had to go up there and chisel what God said. Amen. And then come back down. Do y'all get a witness? And when God, when Moses had spent time with God, by the time he came back down from the mountain, the Bible said Moses' hair was glowing. Moses' skin was glowing. Moses had a word for the people of God, but the people couldn't stand it because he was shining too bright. Not only does God give light to his word, his word will light you up. So my question is, when was the last time you were at church and when you left church and went to Sizzler, when you left church and went to work, when you got to your cubicle, you were so glowing from being in God's presence that people that didn't even believe in your God said, can tell you've been with God. I say in his presence, he'll light you up. And I pray that in these troubling times, the faith community will be illuminated by God's grace, by the graciousness of his face shining upon us, so that we might reflect the light of his grace to all the world. Old churches say, shine on us from your lighthouse. Shine! And he'll light you up. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Illumination comes from being in his presence. Being in his presence. Look at the scripture. And if you're not careful, 26 sounds like 25. Make his face shine upon you. 26 says lift up his countenance. Now what's the difference between his face and his countenance? The countenance in the Hebrew means it's the same word, but it's a different context. It means face in 25 and 26 it means to smile it's one thing to look at somebody it's another thing for them to smile at you can I get a witness and so what we see here is that it's similar refrain to 25 but the emphasis speaks of the face of God smiling on his people and the majestic smile of God upon the community of faith and each constituent individual will bring an abiding and abiding and ultimate peace. Watch this. He said, God smiling on us brings peace to us. Watch this. The Lord's favor that is radiating from the divine favor in the midst of his people speaks peace in the midst of any storm. Oh, you don't hear me. 
the ultimate expression of peace and humanity to humanity came, comes in Jesus Christ. He brought peace with God that justifies us through his suffering. Even the angel said it when he was born. I bring you glad tidings for unto you a savior is born. Peace on earth and goodwill toward men. He is the prince of peace. Can I give you something? Notice 25 speaks of grace. 26 speaks of peace. Let me just throw this in free of charge. If you look at the scripture, this is what Jesus is talking about. Peace I leave you. Not as the world give it, give I unto thee. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be scared. God has given us peace. Now this peace is a pacification. It doesn't mean pacifying us like making us dormant. When you say that the, the, the biggest ocean is the Pacific Ocean, and here you're talking about synthesis of opposites, it's called Pacific because that the root word means peaceful. Although the, the, the swells and the storms of the Pacific are catastrophic, it's peaceful. Watch this. In order to have the peace of God in your today, you have to have received the grace of God in your yesterday. 25 speaks of grace, 26 speak of peace. In all of the Pauline epistles, his salutations is grace and peace under, in the name of the Lord. Why? Because without grace, you will have no peace. But to know his peace, you've got to first know his grace. Fellowship with God via his grace and will know his peace through his Christ. Too many of us are operating as, stay with me and I'm done, functioning atheists. Huh? We don't have any peace today. I don't understand how a Christian can be so pessimistic, disturbed, and anxious. When as a recipient of God's grace, even the stuff I can't make sense of, I'm still at peace because I have his abiding presence. And I would argue you may be struggling operating in peace today because you may not have applied his grace in your yesterday. Know his grace that we might have his peace. And I'll leave you. Look at 27. I wasn't even going to preach it. I put it on there in case we got it. But I feel led by the Spirit. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel. I tell you, we're a blessed fellowship. We're not perfect. We're pardoned. But God put his name on us. God put his name on it. So many of our end time eschatologists always talking about the mark of the beast. I ain't worried about the mark of the beast because God already got his name on me. God got his name on this house. God got his name on this church. God has his name on the universal body of Christ. Now here's where this gets interesting. If I was teaching a Bible study, when you read it in the original Hebrew, it doesn't say the Lord bless you. It has four letters that, that, that give the connotation of Yahweh. Y-H-W-H. -H. Now, this was the name of the Lord. This is actually the acronym of the name of the Lord because God's name was viewed as so sanctified that it would be irreverent to even utter it so they just gave the acronym of his name stay with me but here it is in their disobedience and their stiff neckedness the scripture and the, uh, 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 implies that the original Jews have lost his name and this is why he said I came to my own and they received me not but then he comes to the Gentile and at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow some have lost his name and they can't see it in Christ but you and I know that he is the visible expression of the invisible God. He is the homo osha. He is the same substance. He is, it, it, this is what he meant when he says he who sees the son has seen the father, have seen the father have seen me. Come on somebody now we have his name. The Lord Jesus is the all encompassing expression of the triune God here. In him is the fullness of God's character and thereby his name. His name is the name that is above every other name. His name is on his people. That's why they call us Christians. His name is on his covenant in the divine presence. Emmanuel, 
God is with us. Some say the ancients have lost his name, but we know his name. And there's something about the name of Jesus. It's sweeter as the day goes by. Look up and be blessed. Call on the name of Jesus. Don't you leave without the blessing of God. Go with his blessing. We have received his blessing, but it's a stewardship that we need to pass on to the generations to come. You have been blessed to be a blessing. This is why Paul called us a royal priesthood. God gave to Moses. Moses gave it to Aaron. Aaron gave it to his sons. But when Jesus died, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, opening the holiest of holies so that every blood-washed believer is a priest in his or her own home. We're called to be blessed and be a blessing. A peculiar people. Best blessed to be a blessing. We have this legacy of faith and faithfulness that we've received from the Most High. It is a legacy of blessed faithfulness that we're called to pass on to the generations to come. It is here that they can see the God in us. So even in this pandemic shut in at home, this blessed fellowship, call and check on each other, FaceTime or all them other gadgets. If you go to the store, check on your senior neighbors or that mother struggling, single mother struggling with three kids. Pick up a little something, something. Do like Patty and just leave it on the porch. And then as you drive off, call them and say it's out there. We are a blessed fellowship that takes care of each other because he's blessed us to be a blessing one toward another. And even to those outside of our fold, on Tuesday at 10 a.m. to 2, we have the bread ministry. We don't bring, we can't bring y'all in, but Brother Keith and the team is outside. Come get some bread. It's fresh bread. We get it straight from the bakery, not from the uh, almost expired aisle. Our heart's desire is to do what we can while we can till we can't no more. Because he's blessed us like that. Amen. So wherever you are, be encouraged. You're already blessed. We already have his favor. And if you're hearing the sound of my voice, Jesus died, God raised him to bring us in. And if you don't know that, if you haven't received that and believed that and invited him into your heart, today could be the first day for the rest of your life. He, God loves you. Christ died for you. God raised him that you could have new life. And it's a blessed life. I didn't say it was flawless and perfect. We still got kid problems. We still got money problems. But what we have is a peace that passes all understanding that no matter what kind of storm is round about me, I know the Lord will make a way somehow. And I know that sounds like Bible talk. But shoot, a couple weeks ago, I turned 55. I've been living too long in God's favor. Ain't nothing the enemy can do to make me doubt God. He's already brought me through the wilderness. He's already brought me through addiction. Already healed our marriage. Already blessed my children. Already blessed my grandbaby. Already blessed my ministry already blessed my church I don't need to see Jesus walking on water I've seen him do greater works than that in my life in the life of my community and ain't no secret what God can do he's done for others he'll do it for you amen and I'll leave you with this as God spoke to Moses to tell Aaron say this blessing of all the children of Israel the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the countenance upon thee. NIV says the Lord smile upon you and give you peace. And they shall put my name on the children of Israel. And I will bless them. God bless you. God keep you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. a couple of brief announcements this morning as pastor mentioned our bread ministry is alive and well so if you'd like to pick up some loaves of bread come by this Tuesday between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. and we will have the bread in the parking lot you can drive by and pick some up also just a reminder our spring gala that was scheduled for this Saturday is rescheduled to May 1st of next year 2021 so if you purchase tickets hold on to those for next year and we will see you at a, that later date now pastor proctor will be coming for the benediction thank you amen, amen. now 
unto him who's able to keep you from falling. And put your hands up. And present us faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, dominion, power forever. Amen. God bless you till we see you.